record. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. Cabinets HR, focus on your business. We've got your HR. Our guest today is Ken Charming. Ken, are you ready to be great today? Yeah, I am. I'm ready to be really great. Thanks for the invitation. Ken has been involved in major enterprise software projects since 1987 specifically in financial consolidation and reporting systems, and has built high-performance teams in IT startups that were acquired by Oracle, SAP, IBM, and SunGuard. In 2009, he headed up Simulstrat, a spin-out startup from the King's College London Department of War Studies that ran simulations and corporate war games to test business strategy, including response to the swine flu epidemic, and was later sold to Deloitte. Ken is now the CEO of a tech startup company called Uflex Reward, a cutting edge HR tech platform that correlates all costs to do with employees, salary, pension, bonus, shares, to one real-time platform. The technology was built for Unilever, underpinned by agile methodology, now has been rolled out across Unilever globally. So case study again presents to master's students at the University of Oxford. Ken, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm, I'm so pleased to be here and I'm looking forward to a, a really good discussion, Jason. So Ken, um, do you consider yourself an HR person, a software tech person, a business person, a combination of all or something entirely different? Yeah, no, a combination of all and many more things as well. So uh, I'm, I'm also a, a visiting researcher in the Department of Medicine at Newcastle University. So my specialism there is on inequality. Um, uh, which is a big subject today. It's really big, isn't it? So, um, uh, and especially the way that income inequality affects health. Uh, and you, you probably know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. People in the lowest income decile in the UK and the US uh, have 10 years left, less life expectancy than people in the highest income decile. Uh, so when we pay people, we have, uh, which companies do, and HR is responsible for that, uh, we have a direct impact on on the ha their health and how long they're going to live. And the more unequal uh, the the payment regime is, uh, sadly, uh, the greater the effect it has on health. So that that's one side, um, my public health and, and medical academic interest. But on the other side, I'm an HR person. Yeah, I've worked on this project at Unilever for ten years, uh, and it is directly related to how we pay every single person in Unilever. So the two things that I work on, the two big things I work on uh, meet in the middle, that's completely by accident. But I'm an HR person, um, uh, become so in the last 10 years. Now, a couple of months ago, you wrote an article in a magazine called HR Technologists, and it was titled Forays to Offer, um, offer um, uh, Different Options on Low-Paid Employees. Can you talk about that yeah. a little bit? Can you talk about how you know, low-paid employers really don't, don't do employer engagement because they're worried about getting rent, paying basic needs. So how do you expect to be, in, like, engaged, right? Yeah, no, so, um, yeah, you, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of Unilever in this respect, uh, that Unilever has been such a pioneer in lifting up low pay. Yeah, uh, uh, it's signed up to global living wage. Uh, we take a real interest in, in everybody who works in the whole um, reward hierarchy, in the whole pay hierarchy. Um, and uh, there's kind of been, I guess, really since McKinsey came out with the paper about the global war for talent at the end of the, the 90s, there's been a, an acceptance in HR that um, in what I, I um, follow Malcolm Gladwell's view on this in, in, in the belief in the myth of talent, <clears throat> the belief that uh, we should put all our emphasis and focus on the top 1% or the top group of people in the company who create the value, we think, yeah? Uh, and the, the, as we go further and further down the status hierarchy, down the pyramid, uh, people become more and more commoditized and, and actually you can swap people in now. That, that, that's been the way that HR has been organized really for, goodness me, 20 years now. Actually, I, I don't agree with that. I think there's a shift coming uh, uh, and the discretionary effort and the contribution that people make all the way down to uh, the, the people who are doing jobs which um, uh, tend to be uh, dismissed or, or, or low valued in every way, low value status, low value in, in reward. People who've kept the bit, keep, people who've kept economies and companies going, the people who had to turn up 
um, to man machines, to clean the building, to guard the building. The people on the lowest pay actually turned out in the last um, couple of months, uh, and, and still the case in the US, because you, you, you've still got large areas of the country which are, um, which are experiencing uh, a real challenge uh, with COVID. Uh, these are the people who put themselves in harm's way and we need them and they've proved it to us. So um, we need to find a way, we do find a way in Unilever of looking after those people and paying them well. Um, and it's not all about driving the maximum amount of sweat out of a human asset as you can um, uh, in order to satisfy uh, the accountants or the ROI. It's also about being responsible making ESG actually really mean something uh, and coming up with reward mechanisms which keep you competitive in your market at the same time. So reward to me is the, is the kind of um, a neglected area in HR. Um, it, it's an area where um, it's, it's 20, 25 percent of the expenditure of most companies um, uh, and, and it deserves to be treated uh, a bit more scientifically uh, and the way we pay people uh, we need to take more account of in terms of the effect that has on not just the business, but everything else that goes on around the company. Ken, how much do you think empathy needs to play a role in this? You know, like, so example, you have a, a good employee, they're one of the top employees, and they will say, you know, they have a death in their family, and they take the time off of the death, but a month later, they're still not perform like they should. I mean, I mean, we shouldn't give them a kind of break, right? Yeah, sure do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I know some people. I know some people like you know back to the grindstone. I gave you, I gave you your three days off for the funeral. You know, get back to your hundred percent productivity, right? Yeah. Well, I think if you're in a in a very liquid labor market, if you've got excess supply of labor, you can get away with be, that sort of behavior. If you if you're in a market where you're competing for good people, the best people, then you're not going to get away with that kind of behavior. The world will get around. Um, but let's put supply and demand to one side and let's talk about what it's like to be a good corporate citizen. This is becoming something discussed more widely now. You know, the Edelman Trust Survey, which was published at Davos earlier in the year, talks about business being one of the last bastions of your employer for most people is one of the last bastions of trust. You trust your employer. C certainly Unilever has got a really long tradition uh, of looking after its employees. In, back in Victorian times, it was very paternalistic. It built housing, it provided shops, it provided insurance, and it's clung onto that. And I think it's one of the reasons it's been such a long-term success. And you can think of other companies that have done that. But sure, if you want to, um, if you want to exploit um, the availability of of low cost labour, um, you can be like that. But I think I think that the trend is going to come towards, especially with younger um, uh, uh, younger people who've got a, a, a much sharper focus on social justice and what's right and wrong. Um, even even if you can get away with that, you're going to lose clients you're going to use you're going to lose uh, your ability to attract talent you're going to lose suppliers yeah it's it's not the future um but it worked well in the past no doubt about it one thing too you, you have a good point a lot of companies they they take a long time to build up an employer brand it takes a long time to have a great employer brand but i think a lot of companies don't realize how quickly they can lose that right just one small misstep one misguided thing and all that hard work of building up your employer brand is gone Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I think if you look at, uh, if you talk to risk professionals, uh, then the thing that, that scares them even more maybe than a, than a pandemic or, a, you know, the next, the next highly improbable natural event um, is a reputational risk incident where, where the company can disappear overnight because of one slip or one, one flaw. Um, uh, and, and we can kind of see that the nervousness around at the moment as um, as race, which is an explosive issue uh, and something which has been neglected for way too long, has burst into the prominent position it's in now. Uh, and I think there's probably lots of lots of organisations, lots of individuals who are taking a good look at themselves and thinking we should have done more in the past. Uh, we've got to clean things up really quickly now. Um, and there's some liabilities here that we, we've got to, um, we got to manage uh, because we didn't do such a good job. Uh, and reputational risk if you if your name is on the wrong side of a campaign it, it can it can finish your business 
So uh, let's talk about COVID-19 and remote work. So a lot of companies are doing remote work now because of COVID-19. So I, I'm, I think it'd be an interesting item coming up. COVID, eventually COVID-19 is going to end, you know, hopefully, you know, sooner or later. And I think companies are going to be telling the workers, hey, I know you, are we all come, come back to work now? Are we going to go back to your two-hour commute, come back to your cubicle? And I yeah. think people are going to say, hold on, wait a minute. We prove we can be even more productive at home. Why are you going to make us come back to work like this? Yeah, I, isn't it an interesting subject? Do you, do you work at home yourself, Jason? I guess yeah, you, you I work, do a lot of the time. I, I, yeah, I do, yeah, I do both, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Me, me too. So I, I go, I commute to London. Um, I go up on a Tuesday, I come back on a Thursday. So I'm in London three days a week. And, and, and there's something about being in the office uh, in, a, in a startup uh, organization like mine, uh, where we've got a fairly small team, uh, everybody knows what everybody else is doing. We're in a hurry. We got a big mission. We're really passionate about work. There's something about the extra energy and creativity uh, that happens when human beings all get in the same place. Yeah, and, and I don't think we can replicate that remotely. Having said that, I don't think we need to be in the office every day of the week. Um, uh, and and here's a, a, an interesting development. So we we are a startup. We're a a Unilever owned subsidiary, but we operate really independently of the parent company. You know, we, we, we're not even on the HR system. Yeah. We've got our own pay structure. We're, we're completely independent, but for compliance reasons, we re report up all the regulatory channels. Um, so Unilever, like every other big company has, um, uh, had, um, uh, has taken, um, care of its staff and asked them to work from home for the last three months. Um, and sure, there's some really big savings that you could make by shutting down some of those huge prestige offices that you've got uh, around the world. Unilever's got a fantastic office right in the River Thames in London. Um, but something something went missing as well. And, and marketing and, and knowledge working and imagination companies, they do need to get people in one place. So so actually last week we, we were told um, that, 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 that the business is going to um, create a new campus uh, for for uh, an office location. But I, I suspect, I mean, I, I, I'm reading between the lines, I suspect it won't be, here's, here's your desk or even here's, um, here's a hot desk area for you. I think it's going to be much more of a collaboration environment where teams come in and they book facilities um, and they may be in for a couple of days and then they disperse to go back home and, um, and uh, work away in their own cave and then come back in again. I think that's going to be something which is um, which becomes more commonplace. And you probably know that the stats for uh, cities like San Francisco, New York, Chicago show that there's depopulation in the last three or four years as the prices, the rent prices, not just of office, but for living space has gone up. Um, and and talented people have had to move out. Uh, in, it's like a cycle, isn't it? They've moved out to the suburbs, but they're still going to want to go back in the city. So you, you give people, I think, a choice there. I think I think people will find that development well welcome. Uh, that remote working is here to stay, uh, but um, working in complete isolation um, is not. And here's a, a thought for you: work from home. Um, some people have thought, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to a really nice area of the country and uh, uh, somewhere much cheaper, you know, by the beach and I can work from home and I can save money and have a great lifestyle. But let's just bear in mind that home can be anywhere. Yeah, it doesn't have to be in England. It doesn't have to be in the US. Home could be in an emerging economy. It could be in a, um, a high skill, low wage economy. Yeah, uh, because Internet connections are so good. So um, work from home uh, has opportunities and for some people it will pose threats as well. Yeah, it could mean that, that jobs migrate again, another wave of jobs migrate, who, who knows? We, we're only just beginning to digest the, uh, uh, the consequences of what's happened without anybody expecting it to happen in the last three months. You know, it, it's kind of like, I, I, I look at it and I think we've crammed three years of change into three months. Yeah, the way we just push the whole workforce out. Imagine the change project that would, you would have had to go to to push the whole workforce out of the office for three months. God, it would have taken 10 years. Exactly. So, uh, but we proved we could do it. Yeah, human beings are so adaptable. We proved we could do it. Now, like I, I believe in work, work, I think it's a good thing, but also I'm smart to realize that a lot of people are not for 
a lot of people can't handle remote work, right? A lot of people, like, I know there's some extroverts that got to have the human interaction. Yeah. Some people need a boss, right? They're telling them what to do. Yeah. So remote work, I don't think is definitely enough for everyone. And it's, I think that's a trick moving forward. How do you know which of your workers are good at remote working? You know, like, like for me, example, like, I like working from home, but I don't work good at home, home right? I'm, I'm getting up every 10 minutes, eat, getting a snack. I'm taking a child nap to watch some TV, you know, I'm taking a nap, you know. So I'm yeah. not the protector of the house, right? Oh, God, we're making confessions. Let me give you my confession, yeah? My, my Fitbit makes me get up every hour, yeah? So I go and do my 100 steps. But I don't just do that because I've got a really big backyard and I've got a, uh, uh, dare I admit it online, I've, I've got a, a nine-hole golf hole. <laughs> So I, I pitch balls, I put a dozen balls down, hit a dozen balls at the flag, and then I come back to the desk. Well, actually, I come back to the vest in much better shape, so I can justify that. But I think you're right. You know, pe people are adjusting to it in different ways. We've been really flexible uh, with our business. We haven't had um, uh, core clocking in times. Uh, we've given people the, the permission uh, to organize their own day. And, and and in we're a we're a real future of work business. My my company, Uflex Reward, we're so future of work. Uh, we're off the we're not even we're not even in this planet. Uh, so nobody has a job description. Uh, we don't have any performance objectives. Uh, we don't have set hours. Uh, we don't have set holidays. Um, but we do have a group mission. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the people in the company identify with that combined group mission. Uh, and we kind of expect people to uh, contribute, uh, to work hard, uh, to look for who's needing help, uh, to offer help if you've got spare time. It's self-organizing. And, and, and that, is working, that is working really, really well. But I look at it and I think that's exciting. That's enticing. Uh, could you scale that? Could you generalize that? Could that work for everybody? I don't think it could. I think it works for highly motivated groups, but there's going to be other groups who need more support, more help, more supervision, uh, more structure to their time. And, and they, they feel more secure in that kind of environment. So what, it, it's going to be um, a spectrum uh, of, of ways of working uh, with remote running as a theme through that, I, I think. Yeah, I want to follow up that in just a minute. But I think it's funny right now, like our remote work, I say all the extroverts are saying, I can't take this no more. I need people. Give me back the office. The introverts are like, yes, do more Zoom, do more Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you can be kind of extrovert on Zoom, can't you? But the, the, nothing beats the, the you know, the, the, we've got a bunch of senses. It's more than just seeing and hearing. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, you, you do need the proximity of other humans. A man is a social man. Woman uh, is a social animal. Um, uh, and there's a chemistry. I don't know. We can't measure it, uh, but there is something different about all being in the same place together. And, and I hear lots of um, lots of executives talking about that they're, they're going to do remote meetings and they're not going to get in the private jet and they're not going to go zooming around the world anymore because that was a waste of time, money, wasn't it? But ask any senior salesperson or any senior deal maker, do you think you've got more chance of making the deal face to face? They'll say yes. Yeah, so definitely. They'll be on those planes again. Yeah, they definitely will. Things will come back, I'm, I'm, but not as much. Yeah, there will be an adjustment. Yeah, like me, I consider myself an introvert, introvert, introvert. Even I'm like, okay, I gotta. This is ridiculous right now. We yeah. need some, some sort of interaction pretty soon. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So tell me how your company does business. Like no job descriptions, performance views. You know, like we might call the, the employees utopia, right? But like you said, it doesn't work for everyone, right? How do you, like, how do you know the right people to recruit? Can you know highly motivated people, like top 1%? How do you go about finding these people? Right, yeah. So, and this is an interesting dilemma for HR because what we're doing is very much a test bed within Unilever and we attract a lot of attention because there's, as, as you know, there's, there's lots of uh, literature written about the future of work and agile working and, and dynamic uh, self-forming teams and moving away from rigid job descriptions and uh, moving to portfolio of skills across a team and uh, flexible hours, flexible contracts, the opportunity to work for more than one organization at a time. You, you, you talked, I'm a systems person originally, you know, I came into HR by accident and, and, and if you as an HR person just 
just kind of bleh, that all over me and i'm thinking how do we organize this yeah how do we keep records how do we give this structure how do we document it how can we audit what's going on here because what you just described to me was anarchy yeah um, but on the other hand uh, people want a lot more freedom employees want more freedom employees want personalized packages they they regard themselves as really an individual brand these days and, and big organizations are struggling to compete with startups yeah there's so many more startups around now and it's a much freer environment to work in we, we, we work in a weaker work office right in the center of london right next to the bank of england and and the buzz in there is fantastic of course you'd want to work there rather than in a a big glass corporate building where you know you, you move from floor to floor as you progress through your career uh, so how does a big organization give the freedom and creative environment but still have structure that's that's a question for for systems uh, people on the reward side which is which is what we do it, we we are um, we manage global reward for large multinational companies so if you take an organization it, and, and the software was developed by unilever <clears throat> and then spun out to to be sold to other companies we got 160,000 people in the unilever system in 130 countries yeah and, and that's complicated uh, because um, we might have a grading structure for the business with salary bands on each grade and, and we, we, we've got a job catalog which is in the workday system uh, but when you acquire another company they're not in that system when you want to do an innovative startup like we've done we don't want to be in that system yeah but you've got to have control you've got to have line of sight as to what's going on um, so in reward terms uh, what we've done is create an environment where sure you can you can uh, go the old-fashioned way you can say that's you, you want to work for me you're an accountant you've got three years experience I'll look you up on the scales uh, there here you are here's your fixed salary here's your bonus here's your uh, benefits entitlement your pension uh, your stock purchase scheme you might get options but that's the package for you on your grade that that's done people who work for me come and tell me what they want uh, and some of them don't want pension uh, they're trying to save to put a deposit on a flat um, some of them have already got health coverage through their partner uh, so basically what we do is just say well here's the amount of money we think we're going to invest in you you choose in fact I say you go and spend it on your own stuff because you can probably find it um, a better deal than the brokers who supply big companies but if you do that at scale, you have to have a way of recording it and you have to have a way of recording it all around the world. Um, and, and that's really what our system does. Um, it, if you imagine like payroll in big organization, like it could be any big global multinational, you don't have one payroll. You don't have one pension administration scheme. You don't have one benefit supplier because benefits around the world can include things like embalming dead relatives rice allowance chocolate allowance yeah it's kind of out there it all look, it looks good in a spreadsheet but out there uh, there's uh, there's so much going on so what we what we do um, uh, Jason is we we don't try this is really clever yeah and I know you're a clever person so you'll understand it we don't try to bring in the actuals yeah what we do is We've asked everybody who works in HR and reward, what are the policies? Yeah. What are the policies you, you have locally? And then what drives the policies? Uh, and it could be, it doesn't have to be grade. It could be any factor. Uh, so we then, we then have the policies one side, we have the eligibility criteria the other side, which is generally stored in the HRIS. Um, and then we join the two together and we create a simulated world, which is, pretty close reconciles very very closely to the actual world and then with that we can model uh, and we can monitor our pay equity reporting at Unilever is always on it's real time it's up to date because we got this simulated environment and and it updates daily yeah so we have we can cope with the fact that you employ people 
um, on a mix of skills uh, because you can say, oh, well, what do I pay this person? Uh, they're going to do, uh, on our project, they're going to do finance three days a week. Um, they're going to do a day a week of marketing. Uh, they're going to do some project management. You know, they're, it's a hybrid job. That's very commonplace in startups. Big companies want to do it. What do I pay them? Well, in a startup, you kind of strike a deal. But in a big company, you can just say, <clears throat> especially if big companies share their data, which they will, you can just say, let's just do a search. Let's do a search on those skill factors. And the, uh, the result of the search will tell you what the grade, what the pay is for the job. Yeah. So if, if 20 people come back and match that profile, there's going to be a top earner. There's going to be a medium earner. There's going to be a lower earner. There's your grading structure. Yeah. It, it's dynamic and it changes by the day. You know, you don't have to wait for the annual salary survey report to come in to see how you compare with other companies. It's instant. <clears throat> so what, what we did with this system is build a, a multi-tenant architecture so that many companies can all be in the same system and we can anonymize the data. So when they benchmark a job, uh, they can do it instantly, as long as permission has been given, instantly across the whole universe of organizations in the system. And you've got an instant fix on what that person there earns. Now, if we talk about the really explosive topic of the time, which is equality, yeah, pay equality, by an increasing array of factors. In the UK, uh, we have gender pay. Uh, reporting is statutory reporting but this year it expanded to it caught companies in a trap it said if you say you're an equal opportunity employer now we're going to hold you accountable for equal opportunity so that brings in all the other factors um, which means that you've got to prove that you are taking the right measures to ensure that no minority uh, is suffering from bias or, or suffering from unfair pay that's a huge data exercise. Most companies just use samples on that. Uh, actually, when we run a, a query on that, we're running it against the whole database um, uh, uh, with filtered, you know, by I don't know country, grade, job, whatever. I'm machine gunning you, aren't I, Jason? <laughs> but but I, I hope what I'm doing here is um, giving you an example of a modern, unstructured, boundaryless HR system. Yeah. Uh, where where the the data doesn't have to be forced into the straight jacket of columns and rows and tables like we had in generation two IT systems. Yeah, this is unstructured, uh, and actually, um, it's the intelligence of queries which is bringing you the structure. It structure comes after the event. Yeah, we can see everything, uh, but it's the query which gives it its meaning and structure. It's cool. Yeah, it's really cool. So Ken, how do you deal with this? Like you're doing like the, 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 the different jobs, different pay structures and someone, you know, they tell you what they want and, you know, and employees talk and they see someone else again, 25% more than them. How do you deal with that? Do you just say, well, this is what you asked for. You got to keep it. Or do you like, how does that work out? Right. Okay. So we, we, we are the, we're the messenger. Yeah. So my company, um, we serve data. Yeah. So when, when something like that happens, uh, somebody in a big company somewhere else is going to say, uh, this is, we've had this claim made. Uh, is it true? Give me some data on this. Yeah. So uh, first of all, we're going to give you the data and the data will you know, mo most times probably tr prove that it's, it's not true. You know, it's an exaggeration. Somebody's not been telling the truth about what they earned or whatever. But then um, there are lots of other factors. As anybody who knows who works in this area will know, there's lots of other factors uh, besides a human being is identified by many, many characteristics. Yeah. So, so there's the obvious one, or it used to be, uh, there's the obvious one of gender. Well, that's, that's really expanded in terms of its definition, but now identities are, uh, it's almost exponential. And then you've got combinations of identities. So actually when you start looking at that, um, you are going to probably find there's a reason for it. And if there isn't a reason for it, um, uh, get your pencil and paper out, HR people who are listening. If there isn't a reason for it, you've got to do something about it. Yeah. You've got to correct that anomaly. Yeah. Uh, uh, and as long as we substantiated it and we can see it's a fair claim uh, you, that it doesn't, it's not, 
the result of an intentional policy, uh, then the correction can be made uh, uh, and everybody's happier because we all want human capital. We all want human capital, capital to be fairly rewarded and properly rewarded on an equitable, consistent basis. But, but the, the key to it is data. Yeah? At the moment, um, uh, big companies don't have access to reward data. It, it, it's because it's, it's run in so many separate systems payroll, pensions by country, uh, benefits suppliers are regional. These systems aren't integrated. They don't talk to each other. The only time in most big multinationals that you get the whole set of reward data, data for an individual employee in one place is when they get their annual end of year total reward statement. Yep, because it's, it's quite a manual thing to put together for most companies and they give it to you and say this is what we invested in you this year and day one of next year it starts to go out of date and it gets progressively out of date through the year what we've done is make that a real-time system so any employee on any day at any point can immediately see what the company's investing in them Thank so that, you. that's a transformation yeah so this is my third on equal pay so and I think this is what the challenge is like, well, you have a guy and a, a, a man and a woman both get hired for the same job, same company. Yeah. They both get, they get offered 80,000 a year. Yeah. I think stats show 9% of the time, the guy's going to say, well, I'm worth more than this. Give me more. And the company's going to give him a raise. We'll say to nine to a hundred thousand, right? 9% yeah. of the 10, the female is going to say, thank you very much. <laughs> and so it started, start 80, 80,000, 80,000 is now 100,000, hey, 80,000. You're getting the stereotype in. <laughs> yeah. But you're right. You're right. And, you know, and, I, th and I then, think, and then, next year, yeah. and then next year, it's a 10% raise, of course, 10% yeah. Yeah. and yeah. it gets bigger and bigger, right? Yeah. Okay. So it's easy to stop that. It's really easy to stop that. Yeah. Because with systems like the one we've got, whenever there's a movement in, in, a, in a reward package for any employee, um, it could be promotion. It could be a discretionary pay award. You know, it could be a retention award because they're threatening to leave. It could be uh, you recruited somebody in, yeah. Uh, when that happens, the the individual who's taken the decision should get a report which shows them the comparison of that person who's asked for the raise with other people who are on this, of a similar status, yeah. And and that 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 is. Um, uh, it, it's it's in psychology terms, it's, it's a kind of anchoring effect there, yeah? Which is, if you see you're about to break the ratios, if you see you're about to, do, to satisfy that person there, what you're going to do is, is break the rules. And you're going to do, you are, with your decision, you're, you are introducing unfair pay. Uh, then that manager will work harder to find another way to retain that person or to explain to that person um, that we can't do that, yeah. Or if we did that, then we're going to do it for everybody, yeah. And if we do it for everybody, where does that leave the company? It's really, it's really making managers manage a lot of these. Imagine that. Um, yeah, no, yeah, imagine it. Yeah, it would be a good day, wouldn't it? But if you give people the data, it's like um, a speed camera or something. Yeah, it's it's the horth it's the um, the, the horth form in fact. It, it, if somebody's being observed, then they behave better don't they? Yeah. So now you're being observed, uh, you're going to introduce that change there. Uh, and it's going to, uh, it's going to unbalance the system, your names on it. Yeah. You won't do it. Yeah. But, but in order to do that, you need to have really good data, uh, uh serving and most companies don't have it. The, the, the reward systems are so disconnected that they, they don't have access to that. So can your system is data driven is like, is there like a algorithm that runs the background or how does all this work? Yeah, I, do you know what? Some really, really clever people in my business have <laughs> developed a system that I don't understand. Um, no, it's, uh, I joke. Um, it, it, what we've done is, is, is it's, it's your classic new class of enterprise IT system. And what we've done is taken logic and rules out of hundreds of spreadsheets and we've codified them. We've, we've come up with a, a really easy to use programming language. It's not really a language. It's really drag and drop, uh, a way of documenting and programming reward policies in one central databases. 
based. Yeah. Uh, so Unilever um, has for its 160,000 employees um, in the spreadsheets around the world, there used to be pushing 20,000 different policies um, of, of, of reward. Yeah. For all the different things that have grown over time, the specials, the one-offs, uh, and nobody knew what those policies were. The, the people who, who ran the spreadsheet, local spreadsheet did, but a group is kind of like, well, we know what the big number is because we, we, we pay checks out, but we don't know what the principles are behind it. We've dispensed with all that. There's now one, one central um, system for um, documenting reward policies. And if you want to go outside of the company's guidelines, and sometimes you do, sometimes you're, you know, you're signing the next uh, Michael Jordan, you're going to give that person a, a special deal. Well, there's an exceptions uh, uh, area as well. But once again, you tread in the exceptions area, you better have some good reasons for it, yeah, because the organization doesn't like exceptions. Because if you just allow it all the time, everything's an exception. So um, that programming language uh, is the thing which solved a challenge uh, which nobody thought could be solved. Yeah? It, 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 it's so complicated, uh, global reward, with all the different regulations. H here's an example, and I hope we get onto this subject as well, because to me, I'm, I'm, if there's one thing I'm passionate about, it's we can't have massive redundancies around the world because of COVID. Yeah? So, uh, but it's going to happen if we, we in HR don't stand in the way of it. And, and I believe we have a moral duty to stand in the way of it. And I believe we can. It's, it's up to us to, to, to show, to lead the way on this. But if you want to make people redundant to cut costs, why do you do it? Well, it works. It's the most simple. It's, it's the fastest way to cut costs. But it's still complicated because every country in the world has its own regulations about how you can make a person unemployed. Yeah, and in some countries, it's really, really difficult to do. Uh, so we, we, in our system, we have a database of, of severance uh, regulations for every country in the world. And, and I hope we never, I hope we never flick that switch. Uh, but we could. Now, if you look at pension regulations, health, tax allowances, you, it's just multiply it by the, the countries in the world, it's huge, yeah? So why do, people, why do we go for the redundancy route? It's because if we were to say, here's, here's the question for you. We, we ran it as a poll on our website and your, your uh, listeners could, I think they can still vote in the poll. If I was to say to you, Jason, geez, we got to say 20% out of, uh, out of people cost, yeah, because revenues have just fallen off a cliff. So we've got to do our bit. We've got to save 20% out of people cost. A, a company uh, like P&G, that's probably $10 billion more a year, yeah. How are we going to do that? Oh, by the way, uh, you can't make anyone redundant because six months ago at Davos, I made a big speech about ESG and I said that our employees were our greatest asset and we're committed to them. Uh, and if I make lots of people redundant now, um, uh, that, that would be inconsistent. So um, you, you've got like two hours to come back to me with some ideas here on, on how we're going to save 20% off the, the people cost bill. Well, that's a real scenario. You, you can, you can say, well, uh, um, I'll make one fifth of the workforce redundant. That saves it. But if I can't do that, what else am I going to do? Another thing you could do is just say, let's put the whole workforce on four days a week. Yeah. So you, you could do that. Yeah. The math is pretty simple. So we, in our poll said, um, it's like a game theory poll. If you were offered the choice of, um, a one in five chance, a random chance of being, part of the 20% who lost their job, yeah? Or you've got a four in five chance of working four days a week. Which would you go for, yeah? We, and, and of course our audience is HR people, yeah? So it's practitioners, it's professionals. I won't, I won't embarrass you by asking you what you go for, but I can tell you that we had 87% of HR professionals saying 
four days a week. Yeah. So in their hearts, HR professionals want to avoid that axe. Yeah. So, you know, we, 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 uh, 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 and, um, so the giveaway, um, that I am offering, um, to anybody who's listening, um, is free access to a scenario game, uh, that we have built, which is based on a global multinational firm, uh, which goes through that whole process of, well, how do I say 20% of cost without making anyone redundant? Yeah. And so that it's an online, um, game. We're looking for, uh, anyone in the world, HR people, business people, employees to come up with creative new ideas on how we can bring costs down and preserve jobs. Yeah. So, and, and that, that, um, uh, we've, we've tested it with senior executives who do this for a living. We've tested it out on lay people. Anyone can play the game. You can play it as a team. You could play it as a dinner party game. Yeah in which you all got around the table with roles and you had to come up with ideas and compromises on that. And I really hope um, that the HR community uh, says this time we're not going to have, we're not going to do the easy thing. Yeah. We, we, we are going to find, it might mean that we got to find a hundred small ways to save money, uh, but that will be worth it. Yeah. And we've got to then persuade the senior execs, the shareholders, employees, government, uh, that this is the right way to do this because we could still have a V-shaped recovery. Yeah. We, 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 why do we want to lose people who are loyal to us, highly trained, experienced, um, uh, colleagues, friends, uh, if we try when, if we tried a bit harder, uh, we could keep them around because in 18 months or two years, we're going to need them back. In the UK, Rolls-Royce just shed 20% of its workforce. Yeah, there, there isn't one person who isn't a highly trained engineer who just got their cards. Yeah, that's tragic. Uh, 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 and the airline industry will make a comeback. It, it, to me, it doesn't seem logical. I don't know about you. So anyway, the war game gives you a chance to sit in the hot seat come up with your own ideas. The data that we supplied is authentic because it's based on, on data that, you know, we're the data people. We know about global reward data. So it's got a grading hierarchy. You've got uh, great, you've got pay rates, which are appropriate to different countries around the world. Um, uh, so you can, you can, you can enjoy the fun and games, which is going on in, in HR departments who are fighting hard to, to keep people's jobs and, and you can do it at home and send us the answer because we need it. Yeah. <laughs> Ken, so you've been involved with software for a few years. Yeah. What, what, what's changed in software? I mean, as far as like marketing software, selling software, or developing software? Uh, let me tell you what hasn't changed. <laughs> I'll tell you what hasn't changed. Um, software projects, you, 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 you're in a pub or you're at a dinner party and somebody asks you what you do. You say, oh, yeah, I work in enterprise IT. And immediately it's like, oh, God, yeah, we have those projects. They're always late. They're always over budget. They never do what they're supposed to do. It's like you, you'd be better off pretending you did some other job. Yeah. And, and that's never improved. It's never improved. Even with the current new generation of systems, it seems as a sector, we in technology – raise huge expectations <clears throat> the way that software is bought is, is generally competitive tender so there's pressure to bid low and hope you can then get the price up afterwards and if you told the truth you think you never get the deal so you've got like a system that's designed to fail uh, uh, and then i hate to see implementations where the team who's implementing is given a fixed deadline uh, and then they they kill themselves trying to get something finished by the end of the by the, by that date. Yeah. So that's not changed. Now we, this, this, I hope makes you laugh, Jason. Yeah. We, 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 I'm talking to you here as the CEO of an enterprise software company. Um, and you're going to be paying if you're a big company, several million dollars a year to use our system. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's a substantial system and you'll be sitting there thinking, yeah, I don't mind doing that if you're SAP or Oracle or Workday. Um, but aren't you the Ben and Jerry's guys? Yeah. 
don't, don't you make soap and ice cream? So why am I going to buy software from you? You know, because the experts can't even supply it and, and put it in on time and on date. So what chance have you got? So anyway, we had to come up with a way to change that paradigm. Um, uh, we're, we're a high profile project because you don't get a new business like this off the ground without sea level approval. Uh, and the, the one thing above anything else that I've been told has been made clear to me is you can't have one failed project yeah, because you've got the reputation of this firm, which has taken 150 years to build and, and we can't have anybody um, upset about software that doesn't work. So we've, we've turned the whole thing on its head and we've said to the prospects that we have, um, you can't, you can't buy it until you can prove to us that you're worthy of it. Yeah. It's so we build a prototype using your data and your people. So you can see exactly what it's going to cost if we go global with it. Yeah. So it's the whole system. It's not a cut down. It's not a pilot. We, we build a system with you, part of the system, choose your hardest countries and we'll put the whole system in. Then you can validate the benefits then your business case is based on evidence. <clears throat> so you can be certain of it. And when you've got to that point of confidence and certainty, then we can sign a contract. Yeah. So it's gone the other way around. It, it, it's, uh, you, you don't, it, it's, it's our risk and our cost because you know, there's server time and there's consulting time, but our view is that's the response. That's the way that we would like to have, to be able to buy software. Um, it's the way, and, and that de-risks the whole process. Yeah, if it doesn't work, then you wouldn't sign the contract, would you? It, it just makes so much more sense. So what hasn't changed? The way IT is sold, um, which is, uh, you know, I, I understand why. I understand why, uh, because actually it, it's reward. The pressure to bring in revenue and satisfy projections given to analysts uh, and to um, pay big commissions to salespeople creates moral hazard. Yeah, we're removing that. Yeah, and, and I hope we always will. But, you know, one day, one day maybe somebody will come in and say, "No, be like everybody else." But if they do, then I'll go because I don't want to be part of that anymore. Yeah, how's that for an answer? <laughs> Great answer, Ken. You, you talk about this a little bit, but talk about the pros and cons of having a company like Lunar Lever uh, supporting you. Mm. Oh well, it's a dream come true. Yeah, because. You know, here, here I am, um, you can see me, you can see how old I am, you know, I'm nearly 64, yeah, I've, I've, I've just been around the block so many times, so, uh, you know, five, six startups, you know, five trade sales, an IPO, I uh, had one that went bad, uh, and then for 10 years I was just doing advisory work, uh, helping people with struggling projects, that's how I got involved at Unilever, this this project was struggling and I came in and helped them turn it around and then it got better and better. And in the end I said, well, should we set up a business? Um, and I, I'm, I'm talking to you from my, from my farm in the West of England with a lovely country pub up the road. And I've got my, you know, I've got my classic car and my golf hole. And it's like, the, the idea was I was going to come here and not work anymore. Yeah. It was like, you, you've proved enough to yourself um, you've got some money, um, enjoy this, this, this time of life. But if a company like Unilever says, we'd like you to set up a new business, what are you going to do? It's just fantastic. You know, they're, they're one of the, they're one of the biggest brands. They're one of the most respected companies in the world. Um, I work with senior people in that firm and I got to say, I've worked in, with senior people in other big multinationals this lot are just so much better. Yeah. They're, they're human. Um, they're, they're responsible. Uh, they listen. Um, they've, they've got a learning mentality across the organization. Um, they're decision makers. They back themselves. It's just a dream come true. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so I can joke, you know, I can say, Oh, well, we're a software, we're an ice cream company selling software, but it's not really, is it? We're Unilever. Yeah. It's kind of like, this is, you, 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 you have to, you can't say so what to me. Yeah. It's like, well, does it work then? Yeah. Come and see it. Anyway, we're going to build it for you because we've got the resources to be able to build it before you pay a penny. It's just, just 
you know, it's dream come true. Yeah. And, and you're especially not going to say no when you still have the drive and fire and focus, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, and, and I'm working with people who are much younger than me. Practically everybody is, uh, but I'm working with a, a young team who are, they're just great fun and they're, they're, they're teaching me uh, and I am able to give them some advice and pointers based on you know, good experience and bad experience. It's working really well together. You know, it's, it's like a club. Uh, it, it, it's great. You know, I, 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 I don't tell anybody, but I would pay to go to work. Yeah. <laughs> Ken, so, you, so you, like you said, you've been involved in startups for a while. Can you talk about your own entrepreneur journey, why you got started being an entrepreneur, what makes it so fun for you, and why you're still doing it? Well, okay. Um, yeah, I have to do talks on this, yeah. So I, I do talks on this at, at, at Oxford. I do it uh, in Unilever. I've got a, an off-the-shelf answer. Uh, uh, and the person I look to for the answer to that question is Schumpeter, yeah. So are you doing it for the money? No. Are you doing it for the glory? No. What are you doing it for? Because you're a creator. Yeah. You, you feel that something deserves its chance to exist. Uh, so if you talk to somebody who's a construction engineer who works on building bridges or dams, or you talk to an artist or you talk to a, I don't know, uh, a, a, a great performer, uh, they can't give up the experience of bringing something to life and seeing other people appreciate it and standing back and think, well, I was involved in it. There's, there's a great story about the, 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 the person who was sweeping the floor when they were building the Hoover Dam uh, uh, and, and whoever your president was at the time, I think it was before Roosevelt, um, but that it was eventually open. Anyway, there's a tour there and they said to the guy who's sweeping the floor, what are you doing then? Yeah. You know, no, he wasn't sweeping the floor. He was building a dam. Yeah. And, and you feel part of that. If you're an entrepreneur, it's, it's an addiction. Some people want a really secure, stable life. Um, uh, and I respect that, but a true entrepreneur just can't resist that, that chance to go and create another new thing. Yeah. It's, I think it's, you're born with it, but also you condition yourself to it. It does become an addiction. Yeah. I, I, and I, I recommend it to anybody. Yeah. You, we, entrepreneurs are the future of the world. Um, they're looking forward. They've got to create the new jobs. They've got to create the new businesses. We need more of them. And I think some people could argue that being an entrepreneur is more secure than having a corporate job nowadays. Yeah. Well, I, I do. Yeah. So I, if I showed you my CV, um, it, it would show that uh, my average time span over a career in, in a job is not quite two years yeah. because not everything works. Yeah. The, the longest I've ever been anywhere is five years. You know, if it works, you're bought. Yeah. So then you're out. Um, and of course my generation, uh, people I went to school and university with, they've, they've gone into banking, they've gone into big blue chip companies. They've gone into the armed services uh, or uh, public service they've gone the whole way through decade after decade. And now they're out with a pension. Yeah. Which is great. Actually, that's not going to happen anymore. You're right. Yeah. So, um, you, we're all going to have to become entrepreneurs of one form or another. Um, and I feel sorry for people who would like to have more security, who, who would have liked to have had that, um, that, um, uh, job for a lifetime, um, security. Uh, but I would, reassure them that if you work hard, keep reskilling, you do an honest job, you uh, keep good relations with those around you, you increase your chances of being productively employed, doing stimulating things, doing things that you like to do, learning new things through the course of a career that you're going to have to do it. So embrace it. Um, That's a great point. You got to reskill. Yeah. Yeah. It's so I've, I've been to university, what, four or five times yeah, to, to get uh, skills upgrades. It's, it's a cost of a career. Yeah. You've got to put money aside to keep up skilling. Yeah. Uh, and, um, I've heard it said that, uh, in the tech sector now, the half-life of a skill is dropping to two years. Yeah. So 
you know, C sharp used to be like, you know, command your own price. I guess, I guess there's something else now that you're coding in. Yeah. Um, but you've got to always be looking to well, what's the next wave. Yeah. Don't, don't get caught, um, uh, beached high and dry. Yeah. Ken, what's your vision or your goal for your company? Ah, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm going to give you a cliche answer, but I really mean it. Yeah. Which is, um, I, I regard the business as almost like one of my offspring. Yeah. It, it's got that, you've got that kind of emotional attachment to it. You know, you were there when it was an egg and it hatched and you, you bring it up. And I just, the, the, I think the easy way to do this is to really nurture and care for your business and do everything right in your business and make it successful. Um, and you only get good outcomes if you're successful, yeah, you can carry on and grow it and grow it and grow it and become the next Google, uh, or, uh, somebody will come along and buy you. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't have a target exit or end point for the business. My, my approach is, and it's not my idea. I heard somebody else say it. So I, you know, nick their idea. My, my idea is do a good job, create a good business and an exit or the future will find you. Yeah. So it's a really simple way of running the business. You know, every day we have a strategic plan. We have a strategic goal. Our strategic goal, I'll tell you, is to get 60 clients in uh, five years. And if we do that, then we'll have a, uh, a business valuation of a billion dollars. Yeah, just on 60 clients. Uh, but if we have 10, we're still a success. Yeah, if we survive, we're a success. If we survive and we pay everybody their wages, we're a success. You know, but I'm not going to make compromises in order to hit a target. Yeah, we're we're doing this in a very puritanical way. Yeah, we have to because we can't have one failure. <laughs> yes, Ken, I understand you have a, a gift for our listeners today. Yeah, it's the war game. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and um, uh, and uh, and um, you can get that by going onto our website, um, uh, which is uh, the W's uflexreward.com. So that's U, letter U, flex, reward, or one word, dot com. Uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, then uh, my, please email me. My, my uh, personal email uh, work is ken.charman, that's C-H-A-R-M-A-N, at uflexreward.com. Um, uh, and it's uh it's a great gift if you work in hr if you work in reward and you've wanted um an opportunity to show your friends and family what you do uh, and how challenging and rewarding it is then download that scenario game and and you've got the the, the perfect gift there and ken do you have can you uh, um, share the rest of your social media for you and your company yes of course yeah 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 how do i do that <laughs> I, I, I just, I just put the links in, in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Of course we can. Yeah, okay. of course we can. Uh, and I did send you, um, uh, a video, uh, which is the actual video we created to show the Unilever board, what the system does. It, it's a, because it's, it's, new, there, there isn't another system like it in the world. It's a new class of product. Uh, but the video puts it across really well. I think it's only like four minutes long and anybody who, watches that will have a much greater sense of understanding of what we do than you will have by listening to me waffle on about it for the last half an hour. Yeah. Uh, but the video is really good. Um, and we'll put the link in for that as well. And to our listeners, we have the links to his, uh, to his email, his gift, all social media and the video in the show notes. And you can find the show notes at www.cabinetshrblog.com and be sure to, to share this episode. Ken, so we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us any wisdom or advice on anything you want to talk about? I'm going to go back to that plea uh, to HR to stand up and lead the world. Um, it needs us uh, in this moment of crisis. Yeah? So it's not advice. It's, it's a request uh, that we show the way, uh, that we, we show that there are other things besides the acts uh, that we can do uh, to help companies survive uh, and cut costs uh, uh, and create a fairer society. You know, so uh, I'm, I'm asking people in HR to do what they really want to do, uh, do a great job. Ken, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, I've, I've 
thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, and uh, it's about quarter to eight in England, and I am now going to make a pizza on my wood burning pizza oven and oh, have I'm a jealous. beer. And, I'm and jealous. I, and I hope everybody listening has a great Friday night too. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.